Hello and welcome. It's good to see you all this morning. Hope you're doing well. My name is Rob Wegner. I'm with the Institute for Creation Research located in Dallas, Texas. Now, right now we are sheltering in place. I am coming to you live from my home uh, and Dr. Clary is coming to you live from his home. And uh, so we're excited to, to be with you uh, this morning. Uh, this is a, uh, a series that it's, we're kicking off our series right now of Mount St. Helens um, and the 40th anniversary. And we're excited to celebrate this. And, and as Dr. Clary will say, and also Mr. Sherwin later, uh, this was a really monumental time uh, for creation science uh, 40 years ago when this, when this took place. Uh, and Dr. Clary and Mr. Sherwin will get into those details a little bit, a little bit more. Uh, so feel free to continue to listen to the lectures provided here. Uh, we'd love to have you tune in right now and a little bit later when Mr. Sherwin uh, gives his presentation as well. Uh, right now, we have Dr. Tim Clary with us this morning. He received a Master's of Science in Geology from the University of Wyoming and a Master's of Science in hydro oh my goodness, Hydrogeology from Western Michigan University, as well as a PhD in Geology from Western Michigan University. Uh, and after working uh, for several years in the oil industry, he joined ICR in 2013 uh, and has been doing some pretty monumental research uh, that he'll probably touch on a little bit uh, and he'll also hopefully give a plug for his new book that came out just recently um, where he uh, explains a lot of his research. But today, we're going to be celebrating the 40th anniversary of Mount St. Helens. And uh, Dr. Tim Clary, go ahead and take it away, sir. Uh, thank you, Rob. Uh, Mount St. Helens is one of those monumental eruptions that really changed the, how geologists really look at the, you know, the science of geology. I was an undergraduate, so I'm dating myself. I was an undergraduate. 1980 when this erupted. So all my textbooks talked about slow, steady, uniform material process. Well, after Mount St. Helens erupted and they were able to witness all these rapid events that we're going to talk about today, all the things that happened 40 years ago completely changed the way geologists now view catastrophes. They now accept some catastrophes, whereas before they didn't accept any. And so I was kind of in the middle of that. My book said one thing, but what I was seeing in real life was another thing altogether. So we want to review what have we learned in the last 40 years about Mount St. Helens, about the geology and how it's changed the secular, even the secular science of geology. You know, rocks do talk and you can see what happened. So then, therefore what we thought, what they thought isn't true. That catastrophic events like the world's largest catastrophic event, the global flood really did happen. So we're going to talk a little about the eruption first and the repercussions as I was talking about in scientific thought. And, I was kind of in the middle of that as a student studying geology and it caused the secular geologist to reevaluate this idea of uniformitarianism where everything's uniform and there's very few catastrophic events at all. They didn't even like to use the word catastrophism because that implied the global flood. They tried to take that out of their geology vocabulary but Mount St. Helens in that eruption in May 1980, May 18th, 1980, changed that whole view and they had to go back and say, okay, we were wrong. And they now call their uh, uniformitarian thought patterns where they think everything's slow and steady and there's always been volcanoes, always been this, always been that. They now admit that there were catastrophic events that actually caused many of the changes we see. And actually the catastrophic events may, be the res may actually result in more geology corrected than they thought. Well, as a flood geologist, we believe almost all the sedimentary rocks out there that contain fossils anyway uh, were caused from the flood but they now call this actualism. So uniformitarianism has now been altered a little bit to actualism, which accepts catastrophic events. Well, prior to 1980, this was the picture of Mount St. Helens of Spirit Lake. It was known as America's Fuji. It was this beautiful, wonderfully shaped volcano with ice caps all over it that built up for centuries and centuries since the previous eruption, which took place in the 19th century. Uh, Mount St. Helens is located along a subduction zone along the western part of the United States. This is kind of the world map, the plates. You can see those areas where they have these little lines with teeth on them. Those are subduction zones. And Mount St. Helens is part of that subduction zone. The little, little tiny little plate, which they call the Gorda Plate here. Many others call it the Nazca, or not the Nazca Plate, the Juan de Fuca Plate, is actually subducting underneath North America. And that process of subduction is much slower today than it was during the flood. And the flood, of course, we believe it moved very, very quickly. And then once the original ocean crust was consumed, everything kind of slowed down. So today there's a little bit of movement that's still causing these reminders of the flood, what took place during the flood. So here's kind of a diagram of the subduction zone. And you can see the 
Juan de Fuca Ridge, as it's called, Juan de Fuca Plate, is being pushed underneath uh, westernmost Canada and what the state of Washington, a little bit of Oregon. And so there's still a little bit of a ridge, as we call it, these ridges that made the ocean crust out there, not too far offshore, but it's still pushing things underneath very slowly, just a few inches or centimeters per year. Again, during the flood, we think things are moving several meters per second. And so things are moving a lot quicker. Mount St. Helens is known as a stratovolcano or a composite volcano. It's made out of inner layers of ash and cinders and pyroclastic flow, things that flew out of the volcano called pyroclastics, meaning fire, rock, a shot out of the volcano, interlayer with layers of lava. The 1980 eruption and the subsequent eruption didn't really produce a lot of lava, mostly ash and pyroclastic material, as we'll see. But in the past, it has produced a lot of lava flows as well. And some of those are varied uh, quite a bit. You get lavas that are very dark rocks, like dacite and things like that, that are very uh, higher in magnesium and iron versus some of the other rocks that come along in some of their more later eruptions were a little more lighter colored, meaning they also had less iron and magnesium in them as well. You can see some of the minerals actually formed in this rock before it actually erupted. So the magma was crystallizing some of it even before it erupted. But the thing that's unique about Mount St. Helens and the subduction zone volcanoes like Mount St. Helens is they usually produce rocks that are much lighter. This is an intrusive uh, rock from further south in near, uh, coast, near uh, Costa Rica area. And this is actually a rock that's from the Mount St. Helens area from the streams that flowed outside the monument location. But these rocks are very, very similar in terms of their chemistry. So you get a little bit of variety, a little bit of darker rocks and lighter rocks, but ultimately what Mossy Helens produced in 1980 was mostly ash. And so this is some ash that an ICR supporter sent us recently from the 1980 eruption that she had collected, you know, the day after the eruption itself. And so here's a, a lot of that ash that's still around. A lot of people have collected ash over the years. So these composite or stratovolcanoes, because their chemistry is higher in silica, higher in quartz and that sort of thing, and less iron and magnesium, generally, you get a more explosive volcano. Now, so these volcanoes are very, very dangerous. These are the kind of volcanoes that you run away from. You shouldn't be anywhere near. You should be miles away when they erupt. Whereas volcanoes like Hawaii, you know, people run to watch it erupt. It's not as explosive. It's a different type of chemistry altogether. It's all because of the subduction zone. And that's another whole story in itself. So here we can see the historic eruptions in the last 4,000 years. So these are the eruptions that we I think are probably timed about right. Uh, these are all post-flood eruptions. And a lot of the post-flood eruptions that took place to make these Cascades and the Andes and all these other volcanic ranges around the world all helped contribute to the Ice Age that came on after the flood as well. So a lot of volcanic eruptions. But these are very small eruptions that we're seeing even at Mount St. Helens. Well, the last eruption at Mount St. Helens took place in about 1857. It was recorded by native tribes. They did see this erupt, but I don't believe it was as big as or destructive as the more recent eruption in 1980. Uh, but it all began, let's go through a little bit of history, in March 20th, 1980, there started to be some signs that Mount St. Helens was coming back to activity levels again. Suddenly there were some earthquakes. And, and in fact, there were over 3,000 earthquakes, greater than a 2.5 on the Richter scale in that time between March 20th and May 18th. And there were gases given off and steam coming off and all sorts of evidence that the volcano was coming alive, but no scientist knew exactly if it was going to erupt or how big it was going to erupt or what would actually happen. And that's still true today. We can't really predict when most volcanoes are going to erupt. We just know that they're coming back around and they may, you know, they don't normally just erupt out of the blue. There's usually, like at Mount St. Helens, we had, you know, all the way from March 20th to May 18th, there was some warning that something was going on. So the morning of May 18th, there was a plane flying over, you can see here in this photo, and they noticed some dust and smoke started coming up on the edge of the volcano. Other than that, it was a very clear day. And say 827, there was this bulge that got bigger and bigger and bigger. It started sliding down the side of the volcano. And so this 400 foot bulge on the north side actually started to slide. And it had been building up and building up, building up the magma, had been pushing out, making a big bulge on the side, north side of the volcano. So what happened was that bulge started to slide down, big earthquake was set off. A 5.1 earthquake initiated the movement of the bulge. The next thing you know, the, the whole side of the mountain slid down on the north side. And there was an, a lateral blast that went out because of that, releasing that, or that 
pressure that had been building up in that very thick viscous magma that is typical strato volcanoes or composite volcanoes. So there was this big blast that went out and you can see the pictures. Here's the time photography. You can see the top picture on the left and work your way across and then down and across again to the to the bottom right side is the most recent of the four. So the whole thing slid away and blasted. There was about a nine hour eruption that took place that day starting at 832. There was this huge debris avalanche that was the whole side of the mountain that slid down the largest ever recorded landslide in human recorded history. Now there were much bigger ones during the flood and as the floodwaters were receding, but this was the biggest one we've recorded in, in you know, written human history. 3.3 uh, billion cubic yards of material slid down, releasing the equivalent of 440 million tons of TNT. Or you can look at the atomic bomb lateral as well. So it created a lateral blast of debris that exceeded 150, 150 miles an hour. So if you're in that zone, any animal in that zone, of course, you were killed rather quickly. Three fourths of the debris landed in the North Fork Toodle River Valley. And you see this big hummock area, which I've got a chance to walk through several times. All these hummocks, and part of the reason there were hummocks is there was ice in that debris as well that shot out of the original ice that was all over the volcano. And as the ice shot down, it left pieces, chunks of ice, and the rock was so hot that it caused those to shoot to steam. So there are these steam pits shooting out ice, and now today those collapsed because the ice is gone. So you get this undulating topography, as we call it. Well, one quarter of that debris also hit Spirit Lake. And it hit with such force that it displaced much of the water in the lake, caused a wave on the other side of the lake that was 860 feet high. And you can see the line where it sheared off all the trees. Huge, full-grown pine forest was sheared off right at the roots and transported down. So the steam blast, the pericosti flow, some of it was moving at 650 miles an hour, destroyed 200 or more square miles of material. So if you're in that zone, if you're an animal or a human, unfortunately, you were killed pretty quickly by this blast. You didn't have time to run or get away. The blast, you can see here, the trees that got all knocked down, the superheated water flashing the steam as it came out uh, at over 500 degrees Fahrenheit. This material just blasted, knocked these trees down. These are full grown pine trees. They were just knocked down flat and stripped and, and incinerated of all their you know, needles and even a lot of their bark. The blast created about a 15 to 19 mile fan-shaped path of destruction. So on the north side, it just shot out. Most of the force was, the brunt of the force was to the north side, unfortunately. And that's where people were six, seven miles away. And some of these people were killed in that range. They thought they were far enough away to be safe because most volcanoes erupt vertically. Well, this one blasted to the north and then vertically, but the biggest blast was to the north, kind of a lateral blast. So in six minutes, the blast level 3.2 billion board feet of prime forest, if you want to do the math and about, killed about an estimated 175,000 uh, animals in the process. Pyroclastic flows, some of this material shoots up so fast it comes back down again and it flows across following topography and rolling across. This material is coming at you about a thousand degrees, you know, almost like molten lava coming at you at hurricane speeds, 102 miles an hour rolling over the, the terrain. And so if you're in the path of these, you know, it's instant death. It is well. It's similar to what happened to the people at Pompeii. Several pyroclastic flows finally wiped out the people at Pompeii. They didn't leave, and they were killed by these pyroclastic flows. Several of those. Are, here was just one big one that rolled out and across. So the blast went out again for nine hours. You can see the ash and stuff shot up high into the Earth's atmosphere. Stayed up there some of that for several years before it all settled out, and that's what produced that ash that we see all over the Washington State area and even all the to places like Nebraska and even other places kind of went around the globe in those next few weeks and months. What happened ultimately was it blew off the whole top of the volcano. This big pyroclastic flow blew up, blew off over 400 meters or about 1,300 feet of the volcano disappeared. The volcano used to be 9,600 feet and after the eruption it was down to 8,366 if you want to be technical about it. And you can see here's some of the ash, the gray Look, this is black and white photography, but it didn't look much different in color. If you looked at this stuff, just devastated area, totally uh, wiped out. 57 people unfortunately died as a result. Many of them were scientists or graduate students studying volcanoes. Uh, you know, this is a chance for a lot of people to get out there and get some live field work. But unfortunately, uh, people died in the process because it was such a surprise that it blasted so much to the side and not vertically. The, 
ash was so thick that the street lights came on during the daytime on May 18th. So the street lights came on. This is the day, I believe, of May 18th. You can see some of the local cities around there got just the ash was so thick in the air that it blacked out the sun. And then afterwards, and in the course of it, actually, there were laharas or volcanic mud flows, which are fed by the melting snow and ice coming down the side of the volcano. All this water melts, flashes, all that ice, a lot of it quickly was transported down, melted, and transferred down the rivers that drained the volcano. And some of these went on and took out huge log yards, they battering rams, took out bridges. There's lots of videos you can watch of that. Here's some of those log jams from the logging companies that where they got washed away and put into these rivers and part of these mud flows and they became battering rams, taking out bridges in the process. This shows the extent of the damage. Mount St. Helens is kind of there, just kind of just down below that little red area, almost like a red Y. That's the pyroclastic flow deposit. You can see the debris avalanche was the that kind of shaded crosshatch yellowish stuff. The lateral blast though, from the steam blast was all that orange, which is over 200, uh, I think, square miles of area. And then the mud flows. The mud flows were all down all the rivers, even on the even on a little bit on the south side, even, but mostly they went down the North Fork Toodle River and the South Fork Toodle River, and flowed out to the west as they went off. To compare Mount St. Helens, the ash in Mount St. Helens, the thickest ash is shown by a little orange area you can see in this PowerPoint slide. Uh, Mount St. Helens, 19, you know, we think it's devastating. We saw the effects, but it's very small compared to what was happening as the floodwaters were receding. Yellowstone was a much, much bigger eruption. And three of the Yellowstone eruptions, three or four of them are shown here. You can see the Yellowstone Plateau where it's located, the Huckleberry Ridge, the lava ash, you know, much, much bigger lava eruptions and pericostic eruptions in the past. Given us thousands of feet of volcanic debris around Yellowstone, but spread over the country, they can map these out. So Mount St. Helens was big, but not nearly as big as we had, saw at the end of the flood. So what have we learned about in terms of geology? What changed the geologists? What changed their mind? Even those stubborn secondary geologists that don't want to change their mind, they want to believe in uniformitarianism. Well, we learned number one, geological features were observed forming rapidly. They just, they saw these, they couldn't deny it. Number one is quickly formed strata, quickly formed layers of uh, strat stratified layers formed. And so here you can see the strata, there's a person per scale, these different layers. The bottommost layer happened on the day of the first eruption, May 18th. Then a few weeks later, you have June 12th, another eruption, another layer. And March 19th, 1982, a couple years later, that another eruption depositing these different layers. So these were all deposited very quickly. Prior to Mount St. Helens, geologists might have said this might have been hundreds of years or thousands of years of deposition to make this type of, this thick of sediment. And we also, when you examine it in detail, you see it's finely laminated. These layers are very similar to what we see in the rock record from the flood. And it shows that these finely laminated area uh, rocks don't take a long time to form. They can actually literally form almost overnight. And we've also learned in the last few years that in flume studies, the clays, which make a lot of these finely laminated materials, you know, the flood made rocks and fossils, there really weren't any geologic ages because mudstones can be deposited under more energetic conditions than widely assumed. So in flume studies to get those laminated materials like we see here with clays that we see in the rocks today, ones that are solid rock, not ones like at Mount St. Helens, to get those, we have to have moving water. And so even clay stones have been found to be water that has to be moving a foot or so per second. Now, some of these shales from clay are spread across big parts of the United States, like the Chattanooga Shale, it covers many states in the eastern part of the United States. There's one continuous shale layer, and secular geologists, uniformitarianists, still struggle to explain why do we have these clay layers that cover such vast areas. Well, as a flood geologist, that's pretty obvious. That it's not all part of the flood. Vast areas with the same rock types is not a surprise to a flood geologist. So we can see that there are quickly formed layers, the quickly formed layers that Mount St. Helens formed, but there's also quickly formed layers in the rock record that we see evidence of. And now with more recent studies of clays, we see that clays don't just slowly trickle out of solution and come down. Clays, to get those laminated shales that we see, just like on Mount St. Helens, you have to have moving material. We also see evidence of quick erosion in Mount St. Helens. So we have quick deposition, quick erosion. Those are two of the big uniformitarian concepts that are supposed to take millions of years or at least thousands of years, but we see they happen 
literally overnight. The erosion from the second major eruption in 1982 caused a canyon to be formed. It's about 1 40th the scale of Grand Canyon in just five days time. So we can see a 20 mile long canyon coming down the, the south side of Mount St. Helens that carved through some of the recent eruption in 1980, but also carved through some of the solid rock below. So we had 20 mile long canyon moving water, moving about 40 miles an hour of mud flow from melting ice again from the second eruption. Very similar to the first one, but this one cut through and dissected in one day or within a couple days time, this big canyon. So 100 foot deep canyon in a, in a day or at the most in five days through hard basaltic rock. Most of it did form in a day. So if this canyon formed rapidly, you know, our question as a flood geologist said did this one too, and we believe at ICR that Grand Canyon formed because of massive amounts of runoff late in the flood that drained through the edge of the Colorado Plateau that was uplifting late in the flood, forming cracks in the water, it whipped through those cracks and carved out Grand Canyon very quickly. The global flood gives us sufficient water to do these types of processes. Mount St. Helens, we just see a little glimpse with what a little water can do, but a massive amount of water can carve out massive canyons like Grand Canyon. A third thing we've learned is we can get petrified forests, layers of petrified forests in Mount St. Helens. Here's Specimen Ridge at Yellowstone National Park. You can go up to Specimen Ridge. I've hiked up there a few times. You can see these trees, these kind of yellow colored fossilized trees that are standing upright. They, used, they appear to have grown in place. So the secular stories, these things grew in place. You read the signs there and they say, Yellowstone's fossil forests are unique. Many stumps still stand upright where they grew millions of years ago. But when you examine what they look like and you examine what happened at Mount St. Helens, we'll see there's a different story here. So this is what they tell you. But you look at the trees and there's no roots in these trees. They're just standing up bright trunks. There's Steve Austin down there for scale. And you can see these trees and you go examine the roots, they're all broke off. There's no evidence these things grew in place. They, it's like they were dropped there. And the secular scientists said, well, this must have taken 50,000 years for all these layers of forest, you know, multiple layers of forest to actually be in place in the area around Yellowstone National Park during those volcanic eruptions at Yellowstone in the Eocene, which we believe is late in the flood, uh, all these layers, you know, they, their uniform training mindset was this took 50,000 years or more. But when you look at what happened at Spirit Lake from those trees and that big tsunami wave that was caused by the debris flow hitting the lake and sending that water up 800, 900 feet up on the side and coming back, it dragged all those million trees back onto the water. So there's this huge mat of trees and there's still about 250,000 of those trees still floating around today, 40 years later. And many of these trees, because they're thicker at the bottom end, even though they're rootless, are heavier at the bottom end. They get waterlogged and they start standing upright, almost vertically. And as they get more and more waterlogged, they sink to the bottom. And very quickly, within a few years time, we started seeing, and Steve Austin and others did some diving, which is kind of risky. He did some diving, he jumped off as John Morris. They jumped in, did some sonar as well, and looked at what they saw, and they could see vertical upright trees in the sediment down at the bottom of the Spirit Lake. So within a few years after the eruption, there were trees that were already sinking to the bottom, giving us these upright trees. And you can see their upright trees are at different levels, just like they witnessed at Yellowstone National Park at Specimen Ridge. They see trees at different levels. And this is all from one eruption. So it shows that these different levels can just be the result of trees settling out of water at different times, maybe just a few weeks apart. And here's one of the vertical trees from below, a picture of it to verify it. So basically what we're seeing is these trees that are, most of the roots are ripped off, but they're still heavier at the one end where the, where the roots used to be. And many of them sink down, heavy side down, sinking into the sediments at different levels. And it looks like to a uniform interior geologist, oh, that must have been a thousand years after this one, a thousand years after that one. But in reality, this all happened in less than 40 years. So when you go out to your specimen ridge day hike, which you can do today, they've actually had to make a little change to what they've been writing because they too, secular scientists, saw the evidence. So down at the bottom it says this, which I outlined in red. It says the more recent theory proposed the trees were uprooted by volcanic debris flow and transported to lower elevations. The 1980 eruption of Mount St. Helens supports this idea. Its mud flows transported trees to lower elevations and deposited some trees upright similar to what we see at Specimen Ridge. So even the secular geologists had to change their mind, change their sign 
change their uniform chain thought to admit that, okay, this can be explained by uh, one eruption. They didn't quite say one eruption, but they, 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 they really wanted to. So the upright logs of Metzahel did not grow in place. They were transported in, neither did the logs at Specimen Ridge. They were transported in as well, and they just sank at different times, maybe over the course of a week or two, and more eruptions get buried them and burying them, and they get more and more trees. And so all this can happen very, very quickly. It doesn't take 50,000 years. So a classic old earth argument bites the dust again. So what have we learned again? Quickly formed strata, quickly erosion, and petrified forests can form very, very quickly. So let's move on to number two. Geology often demands rapid formation of other things as well. And one of these things that we observe around the world is polystrate trees. Many coal seams, for example, have a tree sticking through them. And you see trees like this, where a tree is buried in sediment, where it, just like at Mount St. Helens, these trees sink into the mud during the course of the flood, and those sediments had to build up around it. Well, secular scientists have to admit that, you know, they might have thought these took 100 years or 1,000 years for those rock layers or more to form. But obviously, they have to say this had to be rapid burial because this tree would have eroded away if it's had around for a couple thousand years. So even the secular scientists, again, when you point out the facts of the rocks, have to admit there is catastrophic deposition going on, even in the rock record, not just the Mount St. Helens. So secondly, uh, geology demands rapid formation of rock layers, rock layers in general. There's no evidence of missing time between many of these layers. Classic example is the Coconino sandstone sitting on top of the Hermit Shale in Grand King. Hermit Shale and Coconino sandstone are supposed to be close to a million years, several hundred thousand years at least between them, but you see a perfectly flat layer between them. There's no evidence of this erosion at all. And sh the shale is very soft. It's that laminated shale is deposited by moving water and then you bring a sandstone right on top of it and there's a perfectly flat layer in between them. How do you explain that? in a uniform engineering mindset. It's very difficult. There's no evidence of time here whatsoever. Here's Brian Thomas, my, my colleague at ICR, looking at some rocks in Texas. And you see again, same pattern, just like I'm not saying, layer upon layer upon layer upon layer. That's the norm in the fossil record or the rock record. We just see rock layers on rock layers on rock layers with no evidence of erosion, no gullies. You know, if these layers are deposited slowly, why is no erosion between the layers? And it, if you go back to Grand Canyon, the Redwall limestone is supposed to be Mississippi in age, they call it. And below that is supposed to be the Mua limestone in many places. And there's supposed to be you know, 160 million years or so of time in between, yet they're perfectly flat just like these. So when you look at them, it looks just like brick upon brick upon brick. This is what real surfaces look like that are exposed for just a few hundred years or a few thousand years. Here's the Tibet sandstone bedding plain. You can walk kind of Grand Canyon and you can see all these gullies and rills forming. There's no gullies and rills between the Coconino sandstone and the Hermit Shale at all. And this was just, you know, recent erosion. You also get rivers cutting through things like we see in the, the picture on the bottom left. There's a little river canyon that cut through. You can see the pebbles in the bottom. This is the type of thing you'd expect to see in those surfaces, but yet they're perfectly flat, as we talked about earlier. So there's no gully erosion. There's no erosion form like on the top surface of the Tapete sandstone. Second point is geology demands rapid formation of the polystrate fossils and they, they don't show any evidence of missing time between the layers. There's no evidence of this erosion. They just say these things. So let's look at why they say these things. They want to make the earth old. They need old ages in order to explain and give evolution a chance. They got to have deep time and evolution go hand in hand. You know, as creationists, we don't believe they have either. But let's look at their age dates. That's where most of this comes from. Radioactive or radioisotope ages are very suspect. Number one or A is a doubtful assumptions and results. The, the three main assumptions in isotope dating, all isotope dates, are you have to know the starting amount of your daughter product. You have to know the starting amount of your parent product. If you're going to compare ratios of what you had and what you end up with, you need to know what you started with. So that's something they have to guesstimate on. Number two, there has to be no gain or loss of parent or pro daughter product from the rock. So there's no other outside influence. It's only, you know, they can get a sample that only the parent and daughter are changing. There's no in and, in and out flux of any other material whatsoever. And these are assumptions that can't be met, assumptions that can't be verified. And any of these three assumptions, of course, are going to cause it to fail 
And thirdly, they have to assume a constant decay rate. So the idea is you got a parent to daughter, you got the amount like your sand, the hourglass tipping over like my ash here at a certain rate. They have to assume that rate has never changed. They have to assume they know what they started with and what they ended with. And therefore they come up with this number. But there's all these problems built into it, as we'll see. And none of the dates work when they know the actual age of the rock, as we'll see, none of the dates work. So Steve Austin, a former ICR geologist before me, he sampled the then 10-year-old dome, the lava dome up at Mount St. Helens after the first couple of eruptions. So he went up there, took some samples, sent them into a research lab, didn't tell them where they were from. And the present dome grew between 1980 and 1986, kind of getting bigger and bigger. It's 876 feet high dome kind of in the middle of that crater. And they were dated using the potassium argon method, which is a standard method used in geology today. Certain minerals dated to 350,000 years ago. So they looked at just individual minerals in there. The lab said these are 350,000 year old lavas. When they looked at the whole rock, these rocks came back 2.4 million years old. So age dates use potassium argon as a standard method used in geology come back with the ridiculously old numbers between 350,000 and 2.4 million. And these rocks formed, we virtually witnessed them cooling in 10 years time at the time Steve sampled these. So how do they justify that? Well, they're like, well, there might've been some problems with this and that. Maybe these minerals formed deeper in the earth. And you know, they, they have some ways to weasel around it. But when you look at other dates, here's an example of some other dates where we know the age of when these basalts erupted, Mount Etna, Mount Lassen, Sunset Crater Basalt. We know the age of these historical records. Yet when they're measured, they come up with numbers that are way out of line. 200 year old lava flows come back 600,000 years. 2,100 year old basalt flows come back 25 million years and on and on and on. And if you think that's not enough, here's another whole page. This is a new page of the same thing from Hawaii. You got Kilauea basalts, 200 years old, 1,000 years old, 1,000 years old, coming back in the millions. Not one of these age dates is even close. And yet we're supposed to believe these things. So again, what have we learned? There's a lot of rapid strata deposition, rapid erosion, even petrified trees can be fossilized rapidly. There's polystrate fossils out there telling us there was rapid deposition. There's layer upon layer upon layer with no evidence of erosion in between telling us it was rapid deposition. And even the age dates that these secular scientists and the old earth guys rely on so much, all of them give us failed results, even when we know the numbers. So how are we supposed to believe any of them? They're obviously wrong. The final example I want to give you is one in Grand Canyon that I see I did a study with the rate project a few years back. And they found the lava flows that poured over the top. These are ice age lava flows. They dated those, sent them to a lab, 1.34 billion year old lava flows that we know occurred in the ice age. At the oldest, they should have been a, a million or two, even if you believe the secular science. And we dated the Cardenas basalt, which is down below the Tapete sandstone, Precambrian basalt flow, was dated at 1.07 billion. So how can this lava flow on top of all that come back to the age date older than the stuff way down below it? That's totally impossible. So we know these numbers are wrong. Every case we study them, uh, we find out if we know the actual age of the rock, to my knowledge, there's been no age where we know the age of the rock getting anything close to accuracy. So if radio estimate methods give incorrect age estimates for rocks of known age, how can they be trusted to date rocks of unknown age? And yet we're supposed to take these as fact. This is one thing geologists still stand by. They still need that deep time. They won't give up on their age dates. They keep saying, but the earth is 4.5 billion years old based on their isotope dating. Well, if they don't get the right answer, why do they keep using it? It's like building a bridge that keeps collapsing. Yeah, they keep doing it. Their whole deep time is collapsing like a collapsing bridge. Yet they still won't give up on it. They keep building it anyway. So in conclusion, Mount St. Helens has taught us a lot. You know, and I was kind of in the middle of it as a geologist who the books all changed from true strict uniformitarianism to this varied version of actualism where they admit that there's periodic catastrophic events. But Mount St. Helens continues to be a, a model of the way God destroyed the earth during Noah's flood. There were a lot of volcanic eruptions that were much bigger than the flood. There was a lot more movement of the subducting plates during the flood, a lot more generational magma during the flood. 
These are just small reminders of the devastation that took place during the flood that we can still witness today. We just have to scale them up a little bit to the global scale. So we can see that Mount St. Helens erupted, but yet it's recovering. Within those 40 years, we've now got huge tree forests. We've got plants coming back, animals coming back much quicker than the biologists predicted. And so just like after the flood, the earth recovered. And we can see that recovery there today in Mount St. Helens. See the animals have come back as well. So there's no uniformitarianism. That's just a, a figment of old earth geologist's imagination. It's all basically catastrophism. There's rapid strata formation. We see rapid erosion of canyons. We see rapid deposition of logs in upright position. We see rapid glacier formation. The glaciers formed again in Mount St. Helens and melted again within two years, and they're forming again. We see rapid rock slab growth in the lava dome, 800 foot high lava dome within a few years time. We see rapid recovery of the ecosystem. The plants and the animals are coming back. And we see rapid lava cooling makes rocks with potassium argon ages appear millions of years old. So by cooling quick enough, it traps the ratios, the parent-daughter ratios are all out of whack. And so we knew the age of this rock, but yet they come back at hundreds of thousands to millions of years old. So again, just like those other examples, we can't really date any of them. I can't trust those dates. Uniformitarianism fails again and again and again. And Mount St. Helens is why we look at Mount St. Helens so much because it shows, it demonstrates the failure of this mindset, this worldview that everything's old and there's deep time because none of it matches what we actually see and what we've witnessed in terms of deposition, erosion, and even the age dates. And the millions of years are not needed. We have a fossil record, we have a rock record, but that's all caused by the one year flood that happened about 4,500 years ago. So if you wanna know more about this, there's a, a really good book written by John Morris and Steve Austin called Footprints in Ash, which ICS still sells, uh, which has a lot of really good pictures and goes through the summary of the eruption. Uh, many of the things that I talked about in my presentation today. And there's a Mount St. Helens video that we put out by Dr. Steve Austin I think we still sell that on our website as well. And this is my new book, which talks about some of these things and the formation of Grand Canyon and the deposition of these rock layers across the globe. Uh, this just came out in late March. Uh, it's 496 pages. It's about five pounds. It'll hold your door open in a windstorm. But I hope instead of holding your door open, you read this book because it lays out a whole new flood model and explains the, the flood in a very, very uh, thorough book. But yet it's understandable, I believe, for even the layperson. I uh, put some introductory chapters in there, uh, talk about Mount St. Helens a little bit, and talk about how small Mount St. Helens is compared to what we see happening in the global flood. If you want to know more about radioactive dating and the failures of the radioactive dating techniques and deep time, buy my book, or buy this book by my colleague, Dr. Vernon Cups, a nuclear physicist. This came out a year ago, and it's been a really good seller. And it updates a lot of those techniques and shows the failures of many of the different techniques, not just potassium argon. And then if you don't get any other book, I recommend getting our little $10 Creation Basics and Beyond book written by this, most of the science staff at ICR, which talks about a lot of these things, including uh, Mount St. Helens, but also biology and astronomy, evidence of a young earth, evidence that's out there that's being ignored by most secular scientists. And if nothing else, again, we're going down in price, to the free products here. Acts and Facts is free every month. You can get this electronically. You can get this mailed to your door. Uh, either way, it's free. And so that's our free gift to you, uh, paid for by our supporters of ICR. It's written every month. We have articles written by our scientists and, and sometimes some of our layperson staff as well, showing evidence of a global flood, showing evidence of a younger, exactly confirming what the Bible says. And when we get opened up again, which we will be soon, uh, come to our Discovery Center here in Dallas, uh, visit ICR, visit, swinging through Dallas sometime, uh, come and see us. We have this multi-million dollar Discovery Center that with our 3D planetarium and all these exhibits that you can see. And I think if you look on our website online, you can actually take a virtual tour of that as well. Uh, so come on down to Dallas, as we say. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Clary, for your talk. And, uh, and thank you all for joining joining us in celebrating Mount St. Helens uh, and the 40th anniversary with us today. Uh, and make sure you tune in. Uh, Dr. Clary alluded uh, to some of the rapid recovery of um, that happened shortly after the explosions. Uh, and Mr. Frank Sherwin 
who is our uh, on-staff zoologist and biologist, is going to be talking about the rapid recovery in just a few short hours. So make sure you tune in and listen to that next talk. Until then, we'll see you later.